for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And if you want to go over from there to Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 through 12, amen. Isaiah 28, 9 through 12, you want to put those up there, Josh, and that way I'll be able to read it. Uh, whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from, weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest whereby ye may cause the weary to rest. This is refreshing, and for all that they would not hear. And from there to um, Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 6. Amen. My people have been lost sheep. The Lord said through Jeremiah, their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on mountains and they have gone from mountain to hill and they have forgotten. What have they forgotten? Their resting place. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, we just love you so very much and I thank you, Lord, again. Jesus, for your touch in our lives. I thank you, Lord, that you're a part of part of this service today, Lord, and that, Jesus, I know that you want to do a work in each and every one of us today. God, I pray that right now, Lord, as we stand in your presence, that we will just open up our hearts, souls, and minds for you to be able to work through your word and through your spirit in each one of our lives. I pray it in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Good to have everybody here. It's good to see you all. And of course, it's so great to be able to be in church today, isn't it? Amen. Amen. First of all, I'm just going to go back to the first message and just refresh our memory just a little bit about the meaning of the word rest. Uh, we're going to be talking about that in greater measure today as I preach. Uh, the word rest means to refresh. It also, the word, uh, second word of the definition is recreation. Now, now recreation is made up of, of two separate words. And the first one is re and the second one is creation. So literally, it's made, means to recreate. Everybody say to recreate. recreate. Now, I think that's kind of cool, don't you? And uh, and so we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that as we make our way through this message. The last part of the definition of rest it means to strengthen, and uh, I know that all of us need spiritual strength. So, um, how many have ever been a long time without sleep? A few times. We're gonna, probably I th I feel the way that God is leading me that we're probably going to preach a little bit more on that next Sunday, but. Um, but we'll leave that for the time being and deal with uh, the subject that I feel like is for today and for today's service and, uh, and just go through with that. So first of all, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 6, it says that uh, God's people had, uh, had strayed. They had gone away. And one of the reasons that, that, that the Bible talks about them going astray, and the uh, fact is the comparison is to sheep who have strayed away from the, from the fold and from the shepherd is because, uh, first of all, uh, they had leaders who were misleading them. They were leading them in, in directions that God hadn't given for them to be led in. And as a result, the people, the sheep, as, as they're compared to, had strayed away from where they should be. But the second part of it was that they had forgotten their resting place. Now, if, you're, if you don't get enough rest, weariness is going to set in. If you don't get enough rest, sooner or later, there's going to be a time in your life where, where things are going to happen and you're just going to feel like, I'm going to give up. I'm going to walk away. And uh, some people do that in, in our day and age. How many have noticed that there seems to be almost a correlation in our day and age with, 
the busyness of people's lifestyles with people abdicating away from their responsibilities, family-wise, children-wise, all the rest of it, those things that go along with that. And I, I'm wondering at times whether people are just not in a place where they can deal with all the emotional ups and downs of life because they're just not getting the physical rest that they need in their lives. Now, now I know Tim, or not Tim, but John's working night shifts these days. I'll tell you, night shifts used to kill me. I don't know if anybody else has ever done them. Now, he's here. He looked alive today. He was all excited about all the stuff that he bought over there because uh, Alien Sports is selling out. So he's, and he, so he's doing pretty good today. If it had been me, you know, I'd probably been dragging myself in here and, and uh, sitting on the pew and already my eyes would be looking at, you know, falling down a little bit. But generally, if we don't get enough sleep, some of these things are going to happen. We're going to feel like giving up on the things that, that we really should be taking care of and, and in God. God's kingdom, it's even worse than that. So it says that God's people have, they've forgotten their place of rest. Now, now the word forgotten means to be oblivious of through want of memory or attention. So it's, it's not like, now let me put it this way, it's not like it's completely gone. Because really, in reality, we don't ever completely forget stuff. It's back there in this computer that we call it. Now, however big it happens to be in there, for some of us, maybe a little bigger than others. So, but, you know, uh, however much we can retain up there, it's there somewhere. The data's in there. Have you ever been just going through a time and, and, uh, and you just all of a sudden a memory will come to mind and you'll remember something that's way back, from way back that you'll just all of a sudden have a recollection that you thought thought wasn't even there anymore. I was, I was visiting with Milan yesterday and, we're, and we were talking about trying to remember stuff when we were under six years old and, and uh, neither one of us have that great of a memory of those times. You know, might have something to do with age, but I have a ver- every once in a while a very clear memory would come to mind of, of what it was like back then and I, re- I mentioned a few to him. I remember my older brother getting hit in the head with a rock. Somebody threw at him and there was blood all over his face. It really stuck in my mind, right? I remember my first day of school. Because the reason, you want to know the reason I remember it so well? There was one girl that was misbehaving and, and back then, of course, they still had corporal punishment in school. They don't any longer. And they had to take the child out. The teacher was taking the child out and, and because she was just couldn't behave and was so disruptive. And I remember them walking by the outside of the classroom and the girl's just screaming and wailing and all the rest of it and the teacher is trying to get her so that she's not distracting the class and getting her outside. They didn't have an inside hallway back then. So I remember that and, uh, and I remember... I remember my younger brother, Alan, was very young then. He couldn't have been, you know, maybe two or three or somewhere in there. And back then in Surrey, they had the open ditches that were so deep and, and uh, he fell in. And so the memories are there. And so when the Bible's talking about and they have forgotten their place of rest, it's, it's not that it's not retained somewhere in the memory of those that should have been there. It's the fact that they just get too busy with things that they move on to a different place and though the memory is there, they forget how they need to recover. And instead of recovering, they end up just trying to go through the, the mechanics of the routine of life. And, and even in services, we go through mechanics of, of what our service should look like. And, and I come in here and I, I get things ready and I turn on the computer and I'll turn on the, the, the sound and I'll make sure everything's working and all the screen. And we can go through the mechanics of everything that we do for worship. But, but we've forgotten that it's not just about going through the mechanics of things. It's about the, finding that resting place where, where we can recover or we can recreate ourselves again. And now I want you to know that God's awesome because God, when we came to him, has made in us a new creation. What we were is past. What, what we have been is no longer there anymore. But I want you to know we need to go back and recreate that again and again and again. And we can only do that if we find our resting place. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We put out a mind is another part of that definition of forgotten. Is uh, Some people deliberately do it and I don't know why they do it. They, they put things out of their mind because they don't want to retain that. Maybe because they're spiritually dull. Possibly because of pride. 
there's reasons why people would say, I don't need to do this anymore. I don't need to find that place. I'm going to be good enough just going through the mechanics of living for God. And maybe if I do enough good, it'll offset any bad things that I do. And so the balances, when I'm weighting the balances, the scales will still tip the right way. I don't think I'd want to take a chance with that. Because you see, we really don't know what the balances are holding. We just know that if we go to God and He forgives us and that blood is in our lives, that hey, the balance is going to be right. But if we don't find that place we don't find that place, I'm not so certain I'd want to take a chance with that. Through lack of attention, too busy in our mind. uh, I don't know about you, but every once in a while, do you find that your mind is just cluttered? I um, I woke up the other night, uh, didn't have a very good night on Friday night, Saturday. Nothing to do with anything. I haven't, honestly... God's so good, I don't have a lot of problems in my life. Really, I've got a good wife, good children, great-grandchildren, and another one on the way, and I'm just a happy camper, right? And I was camping, so I really was a happy camper. <laughs> but I woke up and, and uh, around 2.30, 3 o'clock, could not get back to sleep. Not because I had any problems. But just the clutter of my mind and I kept jumping from one subject to another and, and over. I think that sometimes we're like that spiritually. We got so much going on and so much clutter that we forget what's important. The important things that we should be taking care of. And so we don't want to forget our resting place. And the definition of the resting place, I know there's ESV says, uh, it says the sheepfold, but the uh, King James says the resting place. It literally means when we take it, take it back, it's the only place actually it's used in this context, the resting place is a place that you lie down. A place that you will repose and rest and and sleep and and recover yourself so that's literally what it means when you take the word maybe that's what david was thinking when he wrote the shepherd's wrote the shepherd's psalm and he says he maketh me to lie down in green pastures the the place of lying down is a place of rest is a place of recovery and uh, possibly David was thinking about that when he wrote those words we have a need in this day and age more than ever uh, of making sure that we get the rest spiritually that we need and uh, as I mentioned we will we'll look at that a little bit more probably next Sunday Isaiah 28 9 and 12 actually 9 through 12 actually gives us an, an inkling of, of where that resting place is for the Bible says with stammering lips and another tongue Paul said in Corinthians that speaking in tongues is a sign to the unbeliever you have to ask what is this a sign of and as it is written in the Bible in the book of Acts we are going to find out in just a little bit it's a sign of the Holy Ghost. So Isaiah is looking and he must have wondered what he was writing when he was writing this. Don't you think? He must have thought to himself because you see it's not the speaking in tongues and it's not the stammering lips that helps us to recover but it is what it is a sign of what is going on inside your soul and your spirit at that point in time. And, uh, and so uh, I think Paul when he was talking about it he said everyone is going to be given the evidence that, that this speaking in tongues, this stammering lips, this getting in the Holy Ghost is exactly that. It is getting in the Holy Ghost. So, let me, before I go any further, I want to tell you that the rest that you get in God is, is not the rest like you would think when you go to, go to your bed and you lay down and you close your eyes and you feel that nice sleepy feeling coming over you. And, uh, and my wife can get that just about anywhere, anytime. She can sit down and, and be reading something and the next thing I'll look over and, and she's got the book holding like that and she's just sound asleep. You know, still holding on to the book, but sound asleep. Uh, we, can, we can watch something and, and almost, almost inevitably about 10 minutes in, she's like this. She has a gift. I don't know how she does that. <laughs> but it's not like that because, because getting your rest spiritually literally means that, that we need to get to that place where the Holy Ghost is working in us and through us again. That's where we're going to recreate. That's where we're going to recover. That's where we're going to have what the strength that we need or, or acquire the strength that we need in order to be able to live for God effectively. Everybody said amen. Amen. So 
So let's go over Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It says this, And when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Now, drop down, if you would, with me to verses 37 through 39. <clears throat> now, the in-between part here is it was noised abroad when they received. There were 120 people in the upper room after Jesus ascended that were praying that God would fulfill his promise and give them the promise that Jesus had talked about. They're waiting. They started off. There were about five or 600 that watched Jesus ascend. Of the five or 600, 120 of them remained waiting in the upper room for the promise of the Father. Now, while they're there, the, all of a sudden, there's a wind that starts rushing through the place. I know this is old, old hat for most of you, right? So let's just go through it. Let's, let's just go through it all over again. Because they're waiting in the upper room. They're all praying. They're all sitting. They weren't standing. And I know that nowadays sometimes we feel like we've got to stand in order to get the Holy Ghost. They were all just sitting there. I was actually kneeling beside my bed and when I got the Holy Ghost. How many remember when you got the Holy Ghost? Do you remember it? It was a vivid, real experience that, that as I was praying beside the bed, first of all, I came home mad because my wife had gotten it uh, earlier in the day and I was mad that God... I remember the message from Tuesday, you know? God, you forgot me, the, the, talking about his grandfather. Or I think it was his grandfather, wasn't it? Yeah, anyway, I'm one of his ancestors. And uh, that's the way I felt. I related to that. God, everybody else that was baptized at the same time as me, the, like, like they, all, they all were getting the Holy Ghost. They were coming up to the front. God was filling them. They were speaking in tongues. My wife got it in a prayer meeting that we had, just a prayer meeting. We're all just, you know, kind of quiet. And, and she just started saying, you know, praying in tongues and, and stuff. And then I'm, I'm upset. Because God, what's the matter with me? Aren't I holy enough? Aren't I? And of course, there's a little bit of pride happening there and all the rest of it. And, and so we went to bed that night and my wife went, you know, the sleep of the, the, those that are rest with God and right with God. You know, she's just gone instantly and, and I'm laying there and God, what's the matter with me? God, why not me? And finally I got up and started kneeling beside my bed and, and God, the boy, the presence of God came in there and I started speaking in tongues. I thought, oh, I got to wake up Dinah and I'm going to tell her that I just got the Holy Ghost, right? And I said, no. Ah, let's not do that. Let's just enjoy this for a while. And I remember the conversation I had in my mind. And the first thing that comes is that you start thinking within yourself, well, I'm probably doing this myself. And I'm thinking, nah, get out of here, devil. I'm not doing this myself. This is a God thing that's just happened. Because if I was doing it myself, I'd have done it already in church. And so it was a God thing. And uh, pretty, pretty spectacular. Well, these guys all there, I'm sure, listen, they didn't even know how it was going to come. They're all in the upper room. Mary, the mother of Jesus, some of the women are there and the disciples and, and all of it. And they had no idea what was going to go on. And all of a sudden, there's a rushing mighty wind that comes through the upper room up there. And tongues of fire sit upon each of them. And they all began to speak in tongues. Can you imagine 120 people speaking in tongues at the same time? It was just awesome. It's like the Holy Ghost came in. Whew, maybe from the back to the front. Maybe from one window and out the other from side to side. But they all began to speak in tongues and glorify God. Now, I've heard that in tours of Jerusalem that they seem to have a pretty, or they, I don't know how accurate it is, seem to have a pretty good idea of where the upper room was. And it's a funny thing, you know, in that upper room, they, they say that you can start worshiping in there and it kind of echoes and it kind of spreads out from there and people can hear it from a long ways away if you're up in that upper room. Don't know how accurate they are. Don't know if it's true. But I do know what the Bible says. The Bible says it was noise throughout the city what was going on. All of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not a small city. And it was noise throughout of that, that something weird had happened and everybody's gathering around. These guys are drunken. And Peter says we're not drunken as you suppose. It's only the... Sixth hour? Third hour? Sixth? Third? I can't even remember anymore. Anyway, he says we're not, he didn't deny being drunk, just not drunk like you think we are. And, and in between the first message or the first passage of scripture in, in second Acts, or the second chapter of Acts, and what we're going to read now, Peter's message to them is in that part. And so starting again on the 37th verse, <clears throat> 
Excuse me, I gotta get a drink of water. Now when they heard this, they were, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Remission is a better word, by the way. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God shall call to himself. And uh, there were added about another 3,000 souls on the day of Pentecost on that particular day. Turn over, if you would, with me to Acts chapter 10. Because you see, when Isaiah started talking about stammering lips and another tongue, on either side of it, kind of hemming it in, in between there, says that, that whatever we choose to believe or whatever we're supposed to follow has to be line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, right? So we want to have enough Scripture that we can prove the things that we're saying. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 uh, through 48 says, Well, Peter, I'll give you a little background. How many know this passage of Scripture? Okay. Most of you know the background, right? Cornelius had a dream. The dream said, the angel said, go send for Simon who is called Peter and he will show you what you must do. He'd been a praying man, given tithes, took care of the poor. He was a good man. If there was balances at at stake here, he would have probably been on the plus side because he was a really good guy. But he prayed lots and it rose to a memorial. And so God sent him a vision to say, go get Peter. Okay, now that, not, we'll get to the scripture that's up behind me. Go get Peter. Peter in the meantime, so up to this point in time, the, the Holy Ghost had only been poured out for the Gentiles and the Samaritans, or pardon me, the Jews and the Samaritans. And, and so the Gentiles were still on the, the Jews were pretty elitist, right? They, they didn't think the Gentiles were, they called them dogs. So they didn't even think they were worth too much. And, and so in the meantime, Peter's having this vision at about the same time of a sheet coming down and all these unclean animals animals, reptiles and snakes and whatever else down there. And, and, uh, and then the word came to Peter, arise, kill and eat. And uh, uh, he said, not so, Lord. This is in his vision, right? Because how can I eat something that's unclean? And God says, don't you call unclean what I have made, essentially. So I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit. So anyway, they get to the place where uh, Peter has his vision three times. And, and about the time that his vision is finished, these guys are knocking on the door saying, hey, hey our, our boss Cornelius wants to talk to you says he saw a vision, says we're supposed to come and get you. And so, uh, so we came and we want to bring you to him because you're supposed to tell him what to do. And so Peter says, okay, already. That's what this vision was all about. And he goes with them. So Acts 19, or pardon me, Acts 10, 44 through 48. Did I read that already? No, I didn't. So while Peter, now he's with Cornelius and his whole house. So while Peter was still saying these things, The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were, this is the reason they knew. For, which is a conjunction, right? For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. That's how they knew that Cornelius' household had received the Holy Ghost. Is that clear to everybody? Like there's, there's absolutely no confusion about the reason that they knew they'd gotten the Holy Ghost, right? And then Peter says, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain some days. Now I'm... We don't do a lot of commanding in this day and age. Have you noticed that in the church? We don't necessarily tell, we kind of, you know, try and convince people what they should do. Peter had no such compunction upon him at all. It was not a matter. If you get the Holy Ghost, I command you to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sin. And so they baptized the whole household and, and so they were amazed that, uh, that God had included the Gentiles in this salvation. I don't know why they should have been so amazed. If they'd looked in the Old Testament, they surely should have seen it already, right? That God wanted to deal with everybody. So going from there to, uh, let me see here. Uh, we want to go to Acts chapter 10. Did, oh, did, no. Uh, was that Acts chapter 10? It was, wasn't it? 
verses 40, Acts chapter 19, sorry. Now, we're some, and you know, and, and again, the Bible doesn't even keep track of the years and everything and how many years, but we're quite a number of years down the road from, from the initial outpouring of the Holy Ghost and the day of Pentecost that uh, people were saved. Now, stay with me, everybody. Because this is our resting place. And it's and again I want to mention it's not it's not the tongue so much that is the resting place but it is the evidence that we have yielded ourselves and that the Holy Ghost has touched and filled us again. Now you say I got it the first time that's enough. Well, the disciples never thought that. Every time they ran into difficulty, they needed to get into the presence of God. And so the Bible would say, and they left that place filled with the Holy Ghost and, and with fire again. And so they would do that. And, uh, and they would go do it again and again whenever they needed to be refreshed or needed strength. So Acts 19, verses 1 through 7. A number of years down the road from this, and Paul is, is going through Ephesus, and, and it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? Can I tell you something right now? I could stop and preach this. This should be preached in every church that is out there right now. Because we have a lot of believers nowadays, but they need to be asking the question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? So most places nowadays falsely think that, that as soon as you believe, you've gotten the Holy Ghost. Well, if that was true, then, then this verse is obviously false and we can take it out of our Bibles. Because Paul is asking the question, have you received the Holy Ghost since you already believed? It also said that they were disciples. In other words, they had devoted themselves to learning about Jesus Christ. Jesus was not just somebody they hadn't heard of. They were studying this scripture. They were studying this, this new religion, if you would. They were studying this new way. They were disciples and they were believers. And Paul asked them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Ghost. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism, and Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying, and there were about 12 men in all. So in every evidence that we have from the book of Acts, we see... And just to clarify, we need to be good students of the Word of God, rightly dividing the Word of God, right? The book of Acts is the only place that you're going to have the history of the early church and how they did things. Everything changed after 320 A.D. Everything changed when Constantine decided he wanted to convert to Christianity and he changed baptism and he changed what was required and instituted a lot of different things that have come down through the years. But suffice it to say, the early church, this is what they believe. And so when we come to this place today, and here we are, we're all believers. Some of us, maybe all of us, have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But... Maybe we've kind of put it off to the side. Musicians, if you will come, let's stand together, shall we? Maybe it's been a while for you. Or as we preached last Sunday, maybe carnality has begun to, to rear its ugly head inside of your life again. Or maybe you've just gotten so that your priorities are all out of whack. And it's no longer about the kingdom of God, but it's more about you and and where you're at. Maybe there's some things that, that we seem to be losing sight of because we haven't gotten to the place where we've entered into our resting place. When when the prophet wrote about this and he said, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, uh, he said, this is... The rest. This place that you're going to get to in the Holy Ghost. 
where God is able to come and fill you again. Because otherwise, I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, we're going to be trying to do this in our own strength and our own abilities. And if we do, then I will guarantee something else also is out that goes along with that. You will fail. You will not, not be able to sustain a spiritual life trying to do it yourself. So here it is today. Jesus said these words. He said, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. Now, I'm, maybe I've got too great of an imagination, uh, but I kind of think that Jesus might have had some scriptures in mind, understanding that the New Testament wasn't yet written. That he was maybe thinking back to what Isaiah said. That with stammering lips and another tongue. And, or maybe he was thinking that, that he went over in his mind, he was thinking about Jeremiah's uh, prophecy that my people have forgotten their resting place. And so when he speaks in these terms, he said, Come unto me, all you who are laden, all of you that have these heavy loads, all of you that are weary, all of you that, that are trying to carry this spirituality by yourself, Come unto me and I will give you rest. Now, John the Baptist prophesied. I come baptizing you in water unto repentance. There's one coming after me. He is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus is the one that gives us the Holy Ghost. That one song I mentioned in one of my messages, Help me want the healer more than the healing. Help me want the Savior more than the saving. Help me want Him who makes all these things possible. Help me want the Holy Ghost, what He is going to give me, more than the tongues, but, but the tongues will be there because it's a yielding to God. And, and when, it, when you do get filled with the Holy Ghost, you will speak in tongues again. For in this place of rest... In this Holy Ghost experience that we've had, there is that recreation again of what God started in us when He first filled us. I don't know whether it's true of you, but let me talk about me because it is true of me. There's times in my life where I'm just busy enough with this world stuff that I get thinking the same way this world thinks. I need to be recreated in the Holy Ghost. I need to be made again. And, and I need that Spirit to be able to fill me and make the changes that it needs to in my life. It also means, of course, the rest that we need. You cannot sustain a life without rest. You cannot do it. You cannot sustain a spiritual life without rest. Spiritual rest, which comes in the Holy Ghost. I need strength for each and every day for this journey and this walk that God has set before me. I don't need it just once in a while. I don't need it just on Sundays. I don't, or on Tuesdays, or whatever day it is that I might get it in church. But I need that strength each and every day that I'm living for Him. I need righteousness that cannot come from doing no amount of good in the flesh, but only comes from my relationship with Him and Him filling me with the Holy Ghost. I need peace that this world does not know. Cannot experience for they will have momentary peace. They will have a time in just a few moments where they might be contented with their lives. Usually it's related to something really good happening that they'll have that and, and no problems and everything is rest now and everybody's behaving properly. That's where their peace comes. But can I tell you something? I need a peace that goes beyond what's going around me in this world. I need a peace that touches my heart and my soul that I can be content with what God has for me right now, right here in this place. I need joy. Romans tells us that the kingdom of God, this church, is righteousness, peace, and joy. Not in this world. It's not in my relationships. It's not in the amount of money I have in my bank account. But I need that righteousness, peace, and joy that comes in the Holy Ghost. And only in the Holy Ghost can we have that type of righteousness, peace, and joy. 
in this resting time, and I don't know whether it's, it's true of you, and I, th- I thought about this. I'll, I'll, there's times I'll wake up in the middle of the night and all of a sudden have a revelation about something, right? Just something that I've been thinking about and something, some problem I want to solve or, or something. In the middle of the night, all of a sudden it'll come to me. I was reading a book recently where this guy said that, that's, that he did all of his creative thinking at night. He'd lie down in bed and have a pad and a pen beside his bed and he'd write it all out. But can I tell you that 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 revelation that we want in our lives for what God wants, for the things that are going to happen, it's going to happen in the Holy Ghost. God's going to reveal things to you about yourself, about your life, about Him. He's going to reveal Himself more fully. In this place, because Jesus called the Holy Ghost the Comforter, in this place you're going to have a spot. Now, the comforter is a bit of an odd word. It actually comes from a word that we use. Uh, you ever read a book about those fish that attach themselves to sharks and stuff? They're called remora, I think. And it's uh, paraclete. And uh, where something attaches itself to you and won't let you go. <laughs> I like that, don't you? That God comes and He, he won't let go. Amen. He's, he's going to come into our lives and, and, uh, and attach Himself to us. And, uh, but we get that in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 I so desire as a pastor of this church that, that this would be a, a church where the Holy Ghost is able to move freely in all of our lives. I want to open up this altar, but I don't want to just open it up so that we can come and pray for a few moments and, and then call this service over and finished and we all go our ways. But I want this to be a place where all of us are going to come and get to that place in the Holy Ghost where God begins to speak through us, that we're giving ourselves wholly and completely to Him. You